Hi, it's me, and today I'll be going over some basic strategy to complete Refraction Railway number 3, Mirror Clock Orange Road in under 100 turns, so that you can earn that fancy looking banner and ID card before the next season. By the time this video is uploaded, you should have just under a month to complete a run in under 100 turns. Before you enter, there's a few things you want to do. Firstly, if you intend to bring an ID in any fight, you'll want to make sure that you start this railway with them being at Uptie 4 and at least level 35. This is the first railway where you'll be able to level up and uptie your IDs and have them update mid-run, so level 35 is preferable until after the first fight if your IDs aren't already higher level. Any ID that you want to use the support passives of need to be at Uptie 3 as well. In terms of Ego, it's important to have at least one Ego that can target seven enemy slots, preferably either Yi Sang's Sun Shower or Ishmael's Blind Obsession. However, if you are against purchasing the Season Pass, you can get Otis's Ebony Stem for Ego Shards in the Dispensary as a very slightly worse alternative. This does mean that you will need to get at least one Ego to Uptie 4. The only non-AoE Ego that is worth getting to Uptie 4 for this railway is Gregor's AEDD, and only if you plan on using Rupture Strats. Other Ego to bring include Ego that can heal you, as well as Hexnail to potentially help you with damage in single target fights. Other than the ones shown on screen, Ego is mainly only going to be used to win clashes, so just bring what you're most likely to feel otherwise. Here's a list of all of the IDs that I believe have some use in battle on this railway. Many of these are only useful in one or two fights, but IDs such as Sync Sinclair are useful in over half of the fights in the railway this time around. Units with the Rupture symbol on them are all used primarily in a Rupture setup, with the exception of Seven Faust, who is just a solid Slash attacker in general. Pride, Pierce, and Slash are the three most common weaknesses that bosses will have this time around. In terms of what not to bring, there's only one noteworthy enemy in the railway that's weak to blunt damage, and not a single enemy is weak to lust this time around. Most IDs don't have very many support passives to choose from, and the best options for those are typically the ones that have the highest passive damage increase. There are a handful of exceptions, like how Middle Merceau can give passive SP if you bring multiple allies from the same faction, or G Corp Gregor and Chef Ryoshu who can provide passive healing. The two most important support passives are from Base Rodia and Ting Tang Hong Lu, who both provide the best damage increase out of any character support passive. Rupture specifically also really wants to have Seven Ryoshu and W Merceau as support passives, because they increase the amount of rupture you inflict. After every three bosses, you'll be given a chance to change your team and also be fully healed. This will revive any dead sinners, and also saves your SP if you switch a sinner to a new ID. Their SP will increase to zero if they are below it as well. Because of this, try to plan out your team for the next three battles at once in order to maximize effectiveness. For example, Rupture is very powerful for the 5th and 6th stations, which happen to be together, so try to factor Rupture into your strategy for the 7th station as well. Station 1, the Whale of the Porous Hand, doesn't really have anything particularly interesting going on, but there's a couple of things you'll want to do while here. The first is to get your SP up as much as possible, specifically on Sinclair since you'll want to use him in every single fight in this railway, and especially because of what the next fight happens to be. Bringing multiple units from the same faction to take advantage of Middle Merceau's support passive is going to be very useful in this first set of three fights. One thing you will want to try and do is to have enough Sin resources to use either Yi Sang's Sun Shower or Ishmael's Blind Obsession at least once in the next fight, since it'll make it a bit smoother. Other than that, there isn't much to say about these non-threatening fish. They even kill each other when you kill them. A good run for this fight should be around 6-8 to eight turns long, usually. A neat trick you can do here is to leave your IDs that you plan to bring to this fight at level 35 so that they generate more SP when you kill the enemies. This is because the mermaids are only level 38 for some reason. Once you get a run you're happy with, you can go to the main menu and bring their level up to 40, and it'll actually change in this railway, unlike the last two. Station 2 is actually not nearly as bad as it first appears. The first wave is just a bunch of trash, and if you field Sun Shower or Blind Obsession, it's very easy to clear all of them in only two turns. It isn't until the Dream Devouring Silk Current shows up in wave 2 that you might have some difficulty. There isn't anything you can do about its initial mass attack, so all of your units are guaranteed to lose a good amount of SP here. You might be tempted to clash with all of its attacks, but this is actually one of the easiest fights to end quickly, like three turns quickly. 
All you need to do is full dive into the fluorescence body part every turn. Rabbit Heathcliff can make quick work of it just by using quick suppression, so if you were able to use Bonnie Sack on the turn before, it'll help out a lot. Don't be afraid to take damage in this fight either. You just need to keep your best slash IDs as well as Sink Sinclair alive for the next fight, and since the fluorescence is only weak to pierce, you probably won't have all of your slash IDs here. The only attack you need to worry about clashing with is Blind Obsession, since it's rather likely to kill or panic a sinner if it hits. Plus, you can kill the fluorescence faster if you win that clash. If you want a bit more safety, feel free to bring a couple IDs that you didn't use in the first station in order to increase their SP. Just be aware that it'll make your silt current kill slower, and you potentially won't have a lot of SP anyways. A good clear of this fight is usually around 5 to 8 turns in length, which is still well below average for now. Drenched Gossipium is the first new fight of this railway, and is honestly not that threatening. You'll want to bring a lot of slash and pride skills to handle its weaknesses, so W. Ryoshu and Sink Sinclair are both incredibly solid choices here. You'll also want at least one character with a really good evade skill. Each time the Gossipium uses Gossipium planting, it will inflict some Gossipium to the target. While Gossipium can inflict a lot of bleed very quickly, you'll want your evading character to focus solely on using their evade since they won't really be attacking anyways. Have them be targeted by this skill on turn 1 to give them as much Gossipium as possible. You want to do this because the attack draining roots is unclashable, but can still be evaded. You can even have your evader redirect another attack to mitigate as much damage as possible from your other units. Everyone else has one job, deal as much damage to the body as physically possible while also clashing with any skills that don't inflict Gossipium. When it uses Encroaching Gossipium, another move that cannot be clashed with but can be evaded, try to have everyone who doesn't already have a Gossipium not take damage from the attack, since it will nullify the evasion tactic. This boss has two other large AoE attacks that are safest to clash against using Ego. It doesn't really matter what Ego you clash using, but if you have a Slash Ego, that should be the preferred option. Once the body has only around 200 HP left, use your best attacks to try and break it, and for the rest of the fight, everyone who isn't evading can just focus on bursting through the rest of the enemy's health bar. It shouldn't take more than two turns from this point in the fight. A good clear of Gossipium takes around five to eight turns on average. There are two main strategies to dealing with Ambling Pearl in a time-sensitive manner. This boss has no real weaknesses until at least one of its parts is broken, so you'll need to be able to have a plan before going in if possible. The traditional strategy of fighting this boss is to focus down the pearl, but regardless of what strategy you use, you'll want to have a 5 target AoE ready for turns 2 and 3 in order to take out the green slime when it spawns in. Focus all of your attacks that aren't clashing on the pearl whenever possible. The boss becomes staggered if without green slime at the end of the turn, which will typically happen right after the skill check at the end of turn 3. While staggered, the boss not only doesn't attack, but the pearl takes significantly more damage while in this state. After the first stagger, it should be very close to being broken, so repeat the process until the pearl is broken and begins using its mass attack. You will have to use Ego to clash with it, but at this point you can deal massive damage by attacking the broken part. The fight should be over in around two cycles of this strategy, which should take 8 to 9 turns, which isn't the fastest ever, but it's still below 10 turns, which is what we want here. The other, faster strategy is to use a Rupture Team, which requires a bit more management and also requires you to reset for favorable skill setups. Most importantly, Red Sheet Sinclair needs to have access to his skill 2 on turn 1 and his skill 3 on turn 2. The general strategy is just inflict 5 Talisman against the shell and then keep your rupture count high enough to destroy the shell altogether. You still need to destroy the green slime when it shows up, so be sure to still have that AoE on the ready. The best one being Faust Fluid Sack in my opinion. Once the shell is destroyed, the fight will likely end very quickly, and it should only take around 5 to 7 turns using this method. Just be ready to reset in case something doesn't go your way. Skin Prophet is likely the most tedious fight in this entire railway. You need to be able to light all of the candles on turn 1, which can be done using Fluid Sack once again. Once you've done that, there isn't much to this fight aside from using your best slash IDs to maximize your damage against the main body. I wish I had more tips regarding this guy, but there really isn't anything I can say beyond just kill him at that point, other than to be sure the candles are lit every turn that they need to be. If you brought a Rupture team in the Ambling Pearl fight, the same strategy still works here. 
Faust lights all of the candles using Fluid Sack, and everyone else can focus on inflicting a bunch of Rupture Count on the main body on turn 1, without much fear of being staggered by the counters or unclashable attacks. Since most Rupture IDs already have skills that the boss is weak to, they're actually a really good fit for dealing with this guy. A good clear should take anywhere from 5 to 10 turns, depending on your strategy and your RNG. Ardor Blossom Moth is not a complicated fight. It inflicts a ton of burn, clashes really high with all of its attacks, uses an unclashable mass attack that thankfully deals zero damage on turn one, and has a very powerful mass attack that it uses every once in a while. It's just as susceptible to rupture as the last two fights, but this time the strategy is the same no matter what you bring. This fight is almost exactly the same as the one with Dream Devouring Silt Current, except it's your HP that's constantly being lowered instead of your SP, and it's weak to Slash instead of Pierce. Focus as many attacks as you can on the wings every turn, and it should die before it gets to use its big mass attack more than once. If you're low on HP at any point, try to use a healing ego in order to prevent your team from being staggered. This is the fight with the most passive damage of any fight in the entire railway, but that doesn't mean you have to take it. It's a simple fight that's quick but difficult, especially if you have bad RNG, and takes about 5-7 to seven turns to clear on average, making it the fastest fight in this railway. Station 9 is almost identical in gameplay to Station 1. Three waves of normal enemies is incredibly easy to get through, especially since you should have enough sin resources to use your big ego once per turn and finish these waves off really fast. Try not to spend more than three turns on a single wave. While this fight is simple, a little bit of bad targeting can result in a big increase to your turn count. The fight can usually be cleared in about seven to nine turns without too much trouble. By this point in the railroad, you should have a turn count anywhere between 38 and 62, hopefully somewhere around 50, because the next three fights are where the majority of your turn count is going to be spent. The first wave of Station 10 is not any different from the fight immediately prior to it, so just try to get past it in around three turns. They're all weak to blind obsession, so that's an easy way to clear them quickly. When Ahab and her goons spawn in, the best thing to do right away is to kill Starbuck as quickly as possible. If you can't kill him in one turn, just make sure he's staggered before he uses piercing thrusts so that you can avoid taking massive damage. You're going to be here a while. That being said, if you want to keep Starbuck alive, you can actually use him to evade Ahab's attacks if the person who's inflicted with Prey Mark has an evade skill. If not, you'll want an ID who can clash with track them to the end in order to soak up the damage. The best two IDs for flat-out tanking the unclashable attacks Ahab uses during the next turn are Pequod Heathcliff and K-Corp Hong Lu, since they both resist Pierce and Envy, though Hong Lu will have to use Effervescent Corrosion once in order to gain his Envy resistance. Once Starbuck is dead, or if you plan on leaving him right away, the easiest way to finish this fight as quickly as possible is to just target Ahab with as many Pierce attacks as physically possible. Kwee has so much total health that trying to kill her first is genuinely not worth it, and since the fight ends as soon as Ahab is dead, ignoring her as much as possible should be a good strategy. While assist defense is active, you want to at least hit through all of Birkeg's shield in order to stagger her on the next turn. If you've killed Starbuck, this gives you a full turn exclusively to attack Ahab. If you manage to stagger Ahab while Quick Wags is staggered, there's a chance that the assist defense effect just won't work at all on the next turn, giving you even more time to target Ahab. Even with all of this, expect this fight to take 10 to 14 turns on average. The way this fight is designed, it just isn't reasonably possible to finish it quickly without some degree of frequent luck. Gas Harpoon is the longest fight of the new railway, but it really isn't very difficult. Her weakness favor the same Pierce IDs that you've probably been using since Station 8, so stick with those. Phase 1 is easily beatable by just winning all of your clashes and also being sure to outroll her evades at any given opportunity. This phase by itself should only take about three turns total since there really isn't much more to say other than win your clashes. Phase 2 is more of the same, honestly. That being said, you'll want the characters who have Prey Mark to win the clash against Echo and Cry, since it's the fastest way to reduce Starbuck's ego to zero in order to cause a stagger. It should take around three turns to cause the stagger, and potentially one more turn to reduce her HP to zero, but this phase is also not too difficult to finish. Phase 3 is the one that both takes a while and has the most room for error. Hitting Ahab while she has a shield will make you lose sanity, but you need to reduce her shield to zero every turn in order to reduce Coffin Leg's ego over time. 
It will also reduce naturally since Ahab has an attack that just consumes it naturally now. Try to make your attacks that take advantage of weaknesses connect first in order to break the shield as quickly as possible in order to not lose as much SP every turn. Otherwise, this is just more of the same. Hit her until she dies. Oh, and Hexnail is really useful here to increase the amount of pierce damage you deal if you've brought Faust to this fight. A good clear of this fight should be 10 to 16 turns in length. I'd advise having at least 15 turns to spare for the final fight just in case something goes horribly wrong. Spiral of Contempt is the final fight of Mirror Clock Orange Road, and it couldn't be simpler, really. Have one of your sinners attack the hands and gain 7 gaze so that their gaze turns into contempt, then have that unit get hit by it shall constrict so that they become inflicted with grasp. Save that sinner from grasp, before they are killed instantly by it, you get 2 turns, thereby allowing you to perform a skill check in order to choose 1 physical damage type and 1 sin damage type to increase the damage of for the rest of this fight, all while using status effects to inflict specific fragilities to take advantage of even more damage and also keeping some amount of gaze on every sinner in order to increase damage more in- <sighs> So, the intended way to do this fight is absurdly complicated. On top of it, it's actually faster to try and cheese the fight using Rupture or Burn, since you don't need to worry about the fact that the boss resists every attack in the game. The three status effects that can most often take advantage of their status's fragility infliction are Rupture, Burn, and Poise, so the team you would most likely to bring to begin with. In the case of Rupture and Burn, you can ignore the mechanics of this fight entirely and just focus on keeping your status counts high to maximize your damage. Poise will probably have to get through the skill check once to increase their pierce and pride damage to speed up the fight significantly. If you don't want to play the rules of the fight even that much, you can always brute force it. Just expect that to take a bit longer is all. This fight can take anywhere from 8 to 18 turns and is the reason why you want to have a good stockpile of turns left over. Beyond any strategy, just make sure that you're clashing with the body parts that you're focusing down, and be sure not to let its mass attack hit you, and you should be able to clear the fight in a reasonable amount of time. And that's about it. If you're missing any particular piece of the puzzle, then I'm changing my in-game company to include all of the IDs that I can to allow you to borrow them, so feel free to add me to take advantage of that. I'd appreciate if you left a like on the video if you found it helpful, and also to subscribe if you want to. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I hope to see you again soon. Good luck on lowering your turn count.